pulmonary embolus and DVT. This is a problem that accounts for millions of death in the, deaths in the United States and around the world. And it's kind of a tricky problem because it has a, a real uh, variable and nonspecific presentation. Some people estimate that uh, more than half go undiagnosed. And uh, there's a 25 to 30 percent mortality without treatment. So it's a it's kind of a complicated situation that uh, that a lot of people don't figure out until it's too late. So the different types of uh, pulmonary emboli are thrombus, air, and fat emboli. We're mostly just going to focus on the the thrombus. They they account for most of the uh, fatal pulmonary emboli. There are chronic and acute PEs. Um, of course, that's just going to be a, a function of how much of the lungs uh, are blocked. And uh, acute can be massive or submassive, which also is a function of, of how much of the lungs are blocked. So the major risk factors that you hear about are immobilization and travel. You know, the classic story is somebody gets off an airplane, uh, they have pain in their calves, pain in their chest, uh, surgery, pregnancy, obesity, any type of coagulopathy, including uh, factor V Leiden, uh, any protein S, protein C deficiencies, as well as MTHFR and some of the, the more rare coagulopathies. Uh, contraceptives are a, are a, a risk factor. They, they increase your, um, your coagulability. Cancer, some types of tumors, <laughs> uh, coagulating substances, and trauma. So the presentation of a pulmonary embolus is almost always ac accompanied by shortness of breath, is often accompanied by chest pain, and is sometimes accompanied by tachycardia. They classically include tachycardia, but, it, but it's uh, not always there. Also, hemoptysis, you, it, these people are sometimes coughing up blood. And most of them have some type of history of immobilization, surgery, leg swelling, or, or trauma. And uh, so th those can help you uh, start making the diagnosis. Now, the rule that, that I've heard most doctors say is if pulmonary embolus comes to your mind, then get the test done. There's also uh, this Wells score that's, that's kind of supposed to, to help you measure the amount of suspicion. So if you suspect there's a DVT, for example, with leg swelling, any uh, alternative di diagnosis is, is not likely, you know, if uh, you're thinking about a pneumonia or a, a cardiac issue, but, it, but it's unlikely in the patient you uh, also I give some points to that. Tachycardia, history of immobilization or surgery, history of DVT or PE, uh, hemoptysis, malignancy. All those things can help you add up how, uh, how concerned you are about it. And so uh, one interpretation of these scores is if you get a score more than four, then you need to get some diagnostic tests, uh, some imaging tests. Uh, other than that, you get a D-dimer just to make sure, you know, to, to ease your mind about it. But uh, again, if, if, you have, if you have a suspicion, you, m you might as well go get the, get the test done to make sure that it's, it's not going to kill this patient. So the test that you do, a D-dimer is a breakdown product of uh, fibrin. So basically it tells you that you have clots that are being broken down somewhere in the body. It doesn't tell you where. So the D-dimer can be used for both a pulmonary embolus or a, a suspicion of a DVT. So, so both apply to, to PEs in the end. So if, you, if you're suspecting a DVT, if you've got leg 
uh, leg pain, pain, leg swelling, a, a positive Holman's test, then you send them to get a venous Doppler to check if, uh, if they have some kind of a DVT. And that's going to be treated similarly to uh, a pulmonary embolus, uh, depending on the severity of a, of a PE. So the, the gold standard, they say, is, is catheterization and angiography, but most people are doing a CT a pulmonary angiogram. It is, it is not uh, totally sensitive. It's only you know, close to 70% sensitivity. So you can, only, uh, you can only sleep so well after you've ruled out a PE with a CT angiogram. An EKG is a possible test. This is this is probably uh, going to be something that you're going to use if you're not sure if it's a PE or some kind of cardiac issue. But uh, there are some characteristic EKG changes that we'll talk about in just a second. VQ scans were uh, one of the one of the main tests that that used to be used for pulmonary emboli. It compares the amount of uh, um, perfusion versus uh, ventilation. So um, they, they only use these really when, when their people are allergic to dye and other things, other reasons why you wouldn't get a, get a better test done. So some of the things that you do see on EKG are sinus tachycardia, that's one of the, one of the biggest ones. And you can see that on the sample EKG here on the right, as well as a right blunt bundle branch block. If the PE is serious enough, then you can get core pulmonale. Uh, you can get severe pulmonary hypertension, which uh, leads to heart failure. And so with that, you're going to see a large S in lead 1, a large Q in lead 3, as well as an inverted T in lead 3. So once we've identified that we do have a pulmonary embolus, the uh, most important thing is to make sure that these people are stable. So some of the major complications of pulmonary emboli, like we just mentioned on the last slide, can be heart failure or, or any type of uh, uh, cardiogenic shock that, that could happen from, from not getting enough oxygen. So uh, you got to give these people fluids in a lot of cases, and uh, you got to make sure that they're getting enough oxygen. And uh, once people are stable, then you think about anticoagulation. Anybody with a PE or a DVT is going to need anticoagulation, which normally will mean uh, Lovenox uh, or some kind of heparinization uh, in the hospital. These, these people can be treated outpatient in some cases if they are stable without other underlying diseases, uh, but, but most people are going to be treated in, in inpatient at this point. And so, so once you uh, uh, heparinize these patients, then you start them on Coumadin for long-term anticoagulation. Some cases are going to need thrombolysis. So these are going to be the people that are, are just not getting enough oxygen to the rest of their body. And so the, the other reason why you might uh, want to do thrombolysis if, is if you have uh, other emboli that are just waiting to be thrown somewhere else and you've got a patent foramen ovale that could send you know, possibly emboli to the brain. So in some patients uh, that have contraindications to thrombolysis, for example, you have an active bleed, this could be happening in trauma or surgery, then, then you'll consider an embolectomy. Also, if, uh, if the thrombolysis just isn't working. So you can do a catheter embolectomy, and you can also do an, an open embolectomy uh, surgery. 
IVC filters are used generally with people who you can't anticoagulate and it's just a, a little wire filter that you put in the inferior vena cava. So uh, thanks to the people who provided the pictures and uh, please make comments if uh, there are any errors in this video as well as if there's just any important information that, uh, that I've left out. I want to try and make these better and I also make sure you don't use this as a guide for uh, clinical practice. Uh, this is uh, just for mainly designed for medical students or anybody else who wants to learn about disease, but, uh, but uh, please use it as just an overview for learning about it. Thanks.